Prime Minister Theresa May has said for the first time that Britain would leave the EU single market. She said that the UK would seek a new customs deal with the bloc. The precise timing and terms of the departure are uncertain as negotiations have yet to begin. In this edition of the debate, we'll discuss what is for certain that Britain is set to become the first European Union member to leave the bloc. We'll also discuss what is not for certain that the UK will have access to EU single market. Question on what terms? It was the speech Britain and the rest of Europe were waiting on. Theresa May's pronouncements on just how her government will manage Brexit, the formal process of leaving the European Union. In a speech directed at hardliners within her own party, as well as the other members of the EU bloc, Mrs. May outlined a hard Brexit for the UK. There would be no partial membership. I want to be clear. What I am proposing cannot mean membership of the single market. European leaders have said many times that membership means accepting the four freedoms of goods, capital, services and people. And being out of the EU but a member of the single market would mean complying with the EU's rules and regulations that implement those freedoms without having a vote on what those rules and regulations are. It would mean accepting a role for the European Court of Justice that would see it still having direct legal authority in our country. It would, to all intents and purposes, mean not leaving the EU at all. Clearly the Prime Minister wanted to show that she does have a plan, unlike what her critics were suggesting, and that what that plan is, that this will be a hard Brexit. In other words, that Britain will leave the European Union, as we expected, but also probably the single market and indeed the European Court of Justice. Britain is entering a new political era dogged by uncertainty. And despite Theresa May's proclamations on Brexit, the formal divorce negotiations between Britain and the rest of the EU, well, that's likely to take a minimum of two years, followed by a period of transition and then further negotiations with Britain's future trading partners. The truth of the matter is these are uncharted political waters for Britain, the consequences of which will not be known for a number of years. Any suggestions this will be a quick, pain-free process have already been dashed. There will be two years of very tough negotiations and the other EU countries are going to be very tough because they are not happy with what's happening and they want to dissuade any other member state from even thinking of taking this route. Theresa May had a stark warning for her EU counterparts. Britain wants to remain a good friend and neighbour to Europe. Yet I know there are some voices calling for a punitive deal that punishes Britain and discourages other countries from taking the same path. That would be an act of calamitous self-harm for the countries of Europe and it would not be the act of a friend. Britain would not, indeed we could not, accept such an approach. And while I am confident that this scenario need never arise, while I am sure a positive agreement can be reached, I am equally clear that no deal for Britain is better than a bad deal for Britain. Parliament has been promised a vote on the final Brexit deal, which may well provide a final glimmer of hope for those who were mindful they would find some way for the UK to keep the door open on Europe. Amina Taylor, Press TV, London. Our guest for this edition of the debate, investigative journalist Tony Goslin joins us from Bristol. And we have senior fellow at the Mises Institute, Mark Thornton, who joins us from Alabama. Uh, I'd like to welcome you both. And uh, let me start with you, Tony Goslin, trying to uh, pick at some of the, uh, I guess, what may be deemed as important statements made there by Theresa May, highly anticipated, obviously, uh, press conference that she had, relaying some uh, of the terms or not relaying some of the terms. Uh, one of the things she said, Britain would seek an equal partnership with the EU, but would not adopt models already used by other countries that have free trade agreements with the bloc. W what other countries may she be talking about, and why would she make that distinction right from the get-go there? 
Well, she may be referring to Norway and Switzerland, who uh, are paying to be uh, and paying a lot of money to be part of this single market. Uh, and one of the things that's quite surprised me about this today, I suppose, we're all learning a bit more and a bit more as we find out more about what Brexit actually really means, is that effectively people are goods. So we can't have a, a, a limitation on migration, uh, economic migration into and out of Britain to uh, what well, is effectively undermining British pay and conditions that the unions in Britain have been fighting for for years. Uh, we can't do that unless we also cut off uh, free movement of goods and services. So it just seems to me We've got a ratchet system, effectively, going on with the EU. What they've said is they are going to only allow uh, slower and slower integration into a political union controlled by the unelected uh, European Commission. Now, of course, anybody that has any kind of idea of what democracy should be is dead against that. And I can tell you where the origins of this really are. Henry Kissinger, the former U.S. Secretary of State under Nixon, uh, said one of the things that frustrated him is he wanted a one phone number that he could use to pick up and tell the Europeans what to do. I mean, he didn't actually say, I'm going to tell them, but effectively that's the way it works with the U.S. The U.S. likes to tell the Europeans to do this and do that. Uh, and they didn't like the fact that they had sort of 30 or so different embassies that had to phone to get anything agreed. Well, I'm afraid the answer to that is tough. That's just the way it is. And so this is why they've had this uh, increasing ratcheted integration. So it's not about allowing individual com countries to come as close as they wish together. The idea is to bamboozle them uh, into getting a bit closer, and then once they are closer, it's saying, well, you can't go back. Uh, and, and although, uh, you know, the, the whole point of this has actually been political, nobody has ever really been asked about this. The first time anyone was asked about it was in the Brexit vote, and the uh, British people said no, uh, fairly emphatically, you know, although the Ramonas uh, want to say, oh, well, there's only a tiny majority. Well, actually, uh, it was a lot of people voting in that that could remember what life in Britain was like before the EU uh, with very strong industries, strong export. I mean, for example, we used to have monthly reports here in Britain about our balance of payments. One of the things that was very important was to make sure we were exporting more goods than we were importing. Ever mm. since we've joined the European Union, that's been out of the window, and we now have a horrendous trade deficit. So it's not been good for Britain, and it's very good to see that Theresa May has bit the bullet today and said that we need to get out of this single market because the European Union negotiators are making things as difficult as they possibly can for Britain. It shows that this is not really uh, an alliance of friends. It's more a kind of cult that people are either in or they're out. And if they want to leave, like the Hotel California, the cult is going to give them a bad uh -huh. time. I'm going to ask you in a second about how the European Union is making it hard for the UK. But, um, Mark Thornton, one of the things uh, here needs to be discussed is the approach. And we're looking at the UK Brexit Minister Davis, who has said that we will have access to EU single market. The question is on what terms. But doesn't that go against the EU charter? And doesn't it imply, in essence, that, uh, hey, you can leave the EU and then you can negotiate your terms? Well, it seems to me like Theresa May is trying to slow down this process of exiting from the European Union. Uh, and now she's created demands of the European D Union that she knows she's not going to get. And so she's put out uh, a statement which is probably further going to delay the process of leaving the European Union. And the, you got to remember the European Union is not a, free, a true free trade pack. It's a free trade organization, but that organization imposes more than $5,000 of taxes and regulatory burden on every family in Great Britain. So it's not, nothing free about it at all. It's just that there's no tariffs um, at the border. So I would recommend that uh, Theresa May stop the negotiations and just simply leave the European Union and then <laughs> establish negotiations for trade afterwards. Uh, that way, the, the Europeans don't have any say-so uh, in the whole matter, and it can be done much quicker. And if uh, Great Britain, the United Kingdom, uh, adopts free trade on its own with no tariffs or quotas coming in, um, then they will be encouraged. Uh, it will, they will encourage the Europeans 
to come to the table and uh, to get freer trade arrangements between uh, the two countries. That's the way I think she should go, uh, get it done, cut the ties, and negotiate one thing at a time. Because if you try to negotiate everything, you're going to get nothing except delay. Tony Gosling, well, that's a new approach somewhat. Um, cut the ties, say bye-bye, and then <laughs> see how you react and perhaps draw them into negotiations that way. What do you think about Mark Thornton's uh, recommendation there? Well, look, Mark, I uh, have to hand it to you. That's a great, in interesting uh, approach. The only thing is, of course, that is just going to wind up the Brussels and the EU even further. I'll just let you into a little secret. Is actually most European countries would be very glad to see Britain leave, mainly because Britain is seen in, across Europe, as a, in, in the EU zone particularly, as a kind of Trojan horse for US foreign policy, that the Brits do everything the Americans tell them to. And that's why it was quite a long time before... Uh, Britain was allowed into the European Union in the first place when it was the common market originally. Uh, I mean, the, the way this has unfolded over the years is, I think, quite interesting. That you started back in uh, just after the Second World War with the in 1951 with the coal and steel community, which was very practical. This is about getting good goods and commodities around a Europe that was rebuilding after the Second World War. Then we had uh, the Treaty of Rome in 1957, which was the initial kind of uh, building of, of uh, trade agreements between uh, European countries that were in the Treaty of Rome. Uh, and it went on for a while. Then, look, we had this strange thing happened in, in uh, 1992, which was the Maastricht Treaty. Loads changed then. That was when they introduced this single market. That is to say, effectively, that a government has got no control over goods and services moving around within the European Union. One of the pernicious things that came in 92 and it really was the reason why Margaret Thatcher was thrown out as Prime Minister is because she wouldn't agree to this. Uh, many people didn't like Thatcher here in Britain but uh, this was one thing she did which was quite good. She was saying look I'm not handing over this sovereign nation to 13 unelected bankers uh, and, and the single market really meant that f the government here in Britain wasn't able to actually protect British industry and we've seen a hemorrhaging both in terms of ownership and in terms of moving factories out of the country ever since there. So that was also when the European Parliament was set up. We started sending these M MEPs and it's a kind of theatrical shadow play really because the members of the European Parliament have very little real power. Uh, at all. They're, they're sent over there, they get great expenses, it's a wonderful gravy train, but all they can really do is slow down laws that are put forward by this unelected uh, European Commission. There are some good things, for example, uh, the European uh, uh, Court of Justice, is, it, it can be really positive and really good. So, I mean, personally, I think we should try within that to guarantee human rights here, here in Britain, but I imagine that the uh, EU will say, well, if you want out of Brexit, they're going to do exactly what Theresa May predicted there, uh, which nobody really wants, but it looks as if this is what they'll do, is to punish Britain as much as possible, so we're not allowed to set an example to other EU countries who want to get out, like I would suggest most Germans and French, if given an opportunity to have a vote, would be out tomorrow. Mark Thorne, do you agree with that? Well, I certainly agree that the U.K. should stop following the U.S. in terms of foreign policy. That's been one of the worst things in, in recent decades of, you know, the U.S. and the U.K. going to war, dragging along everybody with them. That's been awful and it's been terrible. Uh, but the U.K. has al alternatives in uh, cutting ties with the European Union. Uh, it can adopt a free trade policy of no tariffs or quotas with Europe and with the rest of the world, including China, South Korea, so on and so forth, uh, and also eliminate their corporate income tax so that uh, companies from around the world, particularly non-manufacturing uh, companies, uh, can come to the UK, set up operations, set up headquarters, and uh, do cutting edge uh, type of corporations in technology, uh, in terms of uh, pharmaceuticals and electronics and uh, uh, computers and so on and so forth. That's where um, the UK needs to go is to more high tech, cutting edge technology, not building automobiles and things of that nature. Tony Glossing, on two occasions uh, you mentioned uh, that I counted, you mentioned that the EU wants to punish the UK. Now, uh, I, I'm going to use Mark Thornton's words that it's not like the EU has su such a shiny uh, report card in terms of uh, its economic stats when you look at it as a whole. 
especially with three countries uh, such as uh, France, Italy, and Spain running such high debts. So uh, how do you think the EU, based on what you have said, is going to punish the UK in terms of these talks? Well, this is what it will do. I think this is what we'll, we'll be seeing, and it's what we've already seen from Brussels, is really just simply harsh words for Britain saying, uh, you know, you're, you're not going to get what you want. Uh, it's going to be a, basically a minimal deal from us. We're going, you know, we're not going to negotiate unless we absolutely have to. And it's an arrogance, which I think is the reason why uh, so many people across Europe, looking at the financial record of Brussels and also the record of the dealing with the migrant crisis particularly, have decided that they don't want any much, think much more to do with Brussels. Of course, the reason for that is that nobody in Europe has ever elected anybody to run the EU. The, it's run by this unelected commission of appointees. In fact, what we do in our individual countries around Europe is once we get rid of a politician, uh, like, for example, Leon Britain, who was removed here in, under th the Thatcher government uh, under uh, lots of allegations of uh, the VI paedophile scandal back in the 1980s, plus uh, the Labour leader Neil Kinnock, people who've been thrown out either by scandals or by simply by the electorate thinking, well, we, we don't want this person in charge, we're going to kick them out at the election. Uh, these people are then put in charge of Europe at the European Commission. So that's one of the reasons I think it, 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 they just don't stand much chance at all uh, of succeeding in this project anymore. Uh, yes, you're absolutely right about the effect that the uh, economic policies have had in countries like Spain, Italy, Greece particularly has had a terrible time. Also, of course, with its democracy, because the Greeks as the cradle of democracy, uh, they voted to get out of the euro uh, to, uh, not last summer, the summer before. It still hasn't happened. So that's the way I think that we, uh, we are characterising the EU now, is they're not really interested in what ordinary people think. They have no interest whatever in democracy. They're using the media constantly to try and spin and spin and spin to, to keep control. And also, as uh, Donald Trump, the president-elect, just about to become president of the US, said uh, this week, just earlier, this week is uh, talking about the EU being really just there for Germany. And if you have a look at the economic figures, I would agree. Germany has done very well out of all of this. They're now desperate for labourers. One of the reasons that Merkel has embraced the migrants there is because they need people to work in their factories. Here in Britain, we are, we are in a totally the opposite position. The factories are mostly gone. Uh, and uh, the migrant labour is simply being used to undermine the basic uh, working conditions of everybody here. That isn't surprising, really. It shouldn't be too much of a surprise, because the EU, I think, has been effectively designed. Uh, it was designed in 1942 in Berlin. Many people point to this document, the Europäischen Wirtschaftsgemeinschaft, designed in Nazi Germany to run an occupied Europe. And uh, there is evidence that this is the model that the EU was built on, this thing from 1942 that the Nazis cooked up. And uh -huh. also, I would suggest people look at the survival after World War II of Hitler's treasurer, Martin Bormann, because there's been a lot of contention about whether this guy really survived the war. I can tell you almost 100% that he did survive, and there's been a big attempt to cover up whether he did survive. He survived in, in South America, and there's you know some very good evidence of Paul Manning, the CBS US journalist, uh, uh, has, has, has proved this uh -huh. uh, pretty comprehensively, uh, that there was an attempt, an underground Reich, after the Second World War, and even Boris Johnson has pointed this out, the EU is just what Hitler wanted. Well, uh, we've got to talk about Trump, Mark Thornton. Now, in his most recent interview, he said that Brexit, a great thing, EU to continue to break apart. Uh, tell us uh, what he is exactly saying there and why he would be so um, optimistic about this Brexit being a great thing. And, of course, then saying that the EU will continue to break apart. Well, I think he likes Brexit because it's uh, something that's for the people. It's uh, meant to give uh, ordinary citizens an equal weighting in government, not just these powerful elite uh, intelligentsia. And uh, that's all these are reasons for the UK to leave uh, the European Union as quickly as possible. As I said, it's not a free trade uh, thing. It's, it costs people in the UK over $5,000 a year. And so any of the costs associated with uh, leaving the European Union are going to be made up very quickly. If the UK agrees with free trade, where the UK will not uh, tax European exports, they won't attack, uh, tax 
Chinese exports or anybody's exports. It's going to be, you know, announce a free trade zone, announce uh, no corporate income tax, announce, uh, and these are some of the things that Trump is saying. And also announced that uh, all Europeans currently living in the UK uh, are grandfathered in so that they can stay. Just make the right announcements um, and you'll get the people behind you. That's what Trump is doing. I don't agree with him. Uh, he's got a personality disorder, I know, and it's very unsettling. But the idea that government should be run for the people in general rather than the political elites who have cushy jobs in the European Commission uh, and are not, um, there's no counterweight to the, what they do, what, what the, the regulations they impose and the costs that they impose, uh, horrendous. And of course, all these costs are uniform uh, across the EU, which is, again, against free trade. With free trade, you produce according to your comparative advantage. With the EU setting rules uniformly across, the, um, across Europe, uh, that means you're not producing uh, at your comparative advantage. And so everything about it is, is not really free trade. And I think Trump is right that there'll be others leaving. The quicker you get out, the better, because the, uh, the French and the German and the Italian banking situation is, is very, very dangerous uh -huh. right now. Uh, well, uh, uh, the same question to you, Tony Gosling. Uh, Donald Trump promising, he has said, um, the rapid launch and conclusion of a trade agreement with the, e with the UK to help the government of Theresa May make Brexit a great success. Yes, it's, uh, it's really encouraging to hear Trump saying this. I mean, he's having all sorts of problems, isn't he, in the last few weeks before he takes over with a lot of the previous appointees uh, to the CIA, etc. It seems uh, almost attacking Trump in the last ditch attempt until... Uh, his man takes over, Pompeo takes over. But look, all this talk today about the single market, it's important to see where did this single market come from? Nobody ever asked that question. And I can tell you from a paper by Maria Green at Harvard University in 1993, uh, she explained the way that the uh, single market had been put together originally was by the big corporations of Europe, as usual. Uh, and in, in this case, it was Philips Electronics' job to get some people at their offices to decide what they wanted to do. And they kept coming up with the various proposals. And then, and then they, they said, well, I'm sorry, we, we, it doesn't look as if this will be possible. No one would agree to it. And guess what Visa Decker, who was the chief executive of Philips at the time, said to these researchers, he said, imagine yourselves to be the dictators of Europe. You can do whatever you okay. want. And then they finally came up with the single market in 1992, which it looks as if we'll be getting out uh, sooner rather than later. Very well. We're going to have to end it there, unfortunately. We're fresh out of time. Tony Gosling, their investigative journalist from Bristol and also a senior fellow at the Mises Institute. Mark Thornton spoke to us from Alabama. Thanks so much for tuning in to another Thank edition you. of The Debate. From Yikova Tahwe and the entire team in the capital, Tehran, it's goodbye.